I'm with David Thalberger in his Regina studio today to talk about the Mackenzie Art Gallery's permanent collection exhibition, Community Watch. David, over the years, you and your wife, Ronnie, have donated a number of works by Saskatchewan self-taught artists, uh, what we would call folk artists. I wondered if you could uh, tell us how you became involved with this community of artists and what you learned from their outsider perspective. Well, I really got interested in their work when I returned from uh, graduate studies in, uh, in my graduate studies in the United States. This is about 1973, 74. Uh, I had the good fortune to be hired by the Saskatchewan Arts Board to uh, photograph and record their collection of artwork by Saskatchewan artists. And amongst them were several works by a number of artists who were from the smaller towns, smaller communities in and around Saskatchewan. Uh, and s as many of them were self-taught. And I th was looking at that time on my return for, to Saskatchewan for a community of artists that I could relate to and relate with. And I didn't feel at that time that the community around the university and the art faculty were, were kind of uh, the people that I was looking to inter interact with or that were even, that I was really, or were really all that supportive of me and my efforts either. So I thought what I had seen in California was a group of artists who were uh, professional artists who were not from, uh, from what you would say the mainstream, although they were they were very well known there and, and, and many of them had larger reputations than that. But there seemed to be a community at work there that uh, I thought was really important and vital and I wanted to try and approximate that or reproduce that here if I could. And so I was looking around hoping to find a community of artists similar, a similar community that I could interact with. I, I'm particularly interested in your relationship with the artist Molly Lenhart, uh, who ran a confectionery in Melville, Saskatchewan. We have one of her paintings here in your studio. How did you come to know her? I first met Molly at the uh, Watrous Art Salon, believe it or not. I uh, was uh, the juror at the Watrous Art Salon in 1974. And she was one of the artists who exhibited her paintings. And uh, I singled her out along with uh, several other artists as being one of the outstanding makers, uh, painters in that exhibition. As it turned out, I met Molly Lenhart there and she told me that she lived in Melville and ran a confectionery store there. Well, it turns out that Ronnie, my wife, is uh, from Yorkton. So when our kids were little and when we were first married, we spent lots of weekends going to Yorkton and on the way, Invariably, we would stop in at Melville and pay Molly a, a visit, you know, buy a Coke or play a game of pinball, or she would often have tea and cookies waiting, and because uh, I would usually phone her and tell her when we were planning to come, and she would then take me. She worked at night in her uh, studio. She had a little space be, uh, in the back room behind the counter, and uh, in the long winter nights particularly, she would sit back there and work on her paintings, and she would show me the paintings that she'd been making since the last time I visited. And uh, it was kind of uh, that way of coming to know her. And then that's how I got to know her and got to befriend her. And then I bought a painting of hers and I bought another painting and so forth. So it was always an event to go and talk, to, uh, to see new pictures and to acquire some for our own collection as well. This one, by the way, that you're seeing here was the very first painting of this the painting of hers that I bought from the Watrous Art Salon in 1974. Much of Molly's work is about her identity as the, the child of Ukrainian immigrants. And of course, the painting which you purchased was uh, the scene of uh, the childhood home of Taras Shevchenko, the great hero of Ukrainian culture. Other works of hers are more, I would call, romantic reflections on uh, idealized landscapes and uh, her dreams of being an artist. How would you describe her work? Well. Molly was really uh, proudly Ukrainian, I would say. You know, in the bump, there's a bumper sticker that, that she was a bumper sticker. <laughs> proudly, she was proudly Ukrainian, and her work was very much based on Ukrainian culture and history and themes, and that comes through loud and clear in the painting, the, the Tresh Shevchenko. It's, it's called a poet's dream, right? So that was Shevchenko's dream home. But really, as well as the landscapes which she did. She made a lot of paintings, many, many paintings of, of people in costume. Uh, and 
it expanded into other ethnic costumes, all uh, ethnic dress also, but lots of Ukrainian things. And many of them actually double as family portraits as well. So there's there's a wonderful portrait of her as a young as a young girl wearing a sheepskin coat, you know, a traditional sheepskin coat, uh, you know, with the with the with the wool on the inside, right, and the and the skin on the outside, and she's standing in a snowy landscape. Or of her father with uh, w- with his beard and um, and mustache with a yellow and blue sash over his shoulder. Apparently, in uh, in the old country, he was a member of an organiz- an underground organization that sort of worked uh, to uh, for to edu- for education and and uh, well being of uh, people in in the community and so forth. And I guess she tells me that. In this country, he can he continued that kind of work, and uh, you know, setting up schools and uh, community centers and and that kind of thing within the community that he lived lived in, and so she was kind of raised in all of that. She was an only child, and she talked about having being alone by herself and having lots of time with her dreams and making her paint, making her artwork, her pictures when she was a girl. I had a chance to visit uh, Molly's confectionery uh, years ago. Um, frankly, I, I felt it was a, the place was a little run down, and I was I wondered how she actually made a living, and it also made me think about her relationship to to Melville. Uh, do you, was she an outsider in her own community? Well, I didn't know any and don't know really anybody else from Melville except my daughter-in-law who grew up there, and she, the school kids certainly had. Uh, certainly had an opinion about her that was maybe not so flattering, right? But, I mean, she was, uh, she was kind of a, a, a piece of work, I think, in terms of a personality. She was very strong-willed and would not be deterred by anything. Uh, she worked the, long with her. She and her husband, Joe, ran the confectionery, the, uh, in the Fairway Confectionery in Melville for many, many years. And they would work till late at night because there was a shift change at the railway. Like Melville is a large, is a is a large railway uh, exchange, you know, where the where the trains sort of division point division yeah. point. That's it. Yeah. And so she would stay open. They would stay open until late, like midnight or two a.m. So that when the men got off the shift, that they could stop by and get their tobacco and bread and coffee and so forth for the next morning or or whatever. So. And often in the wintertime, one or two, one or the other of them would be there while the other went home, right? And so Molly would spend long nights. In fact, she had a cot in the back room that she could sleep on, and then it doubled as kind of a bit of a pallet also to place to put her paints on and so forth while she worked back there. So she spent those long evenings by herself mostly, and she worked in the back and, and made the paintings. Uh, but it was a living. It was. It was quite. I, th- I thought that when I was seeing it, it was a wonderful place because it was full of all kinds of. Well, her paintings kind of were hanging all over the walls of the of the uh, of the store, and then there were sort of model airplanes that were made by I guess by her son or her children, right? They were dangling on threads from the ceiling, and there were f- furniture kind of like the furniture we're sitting on right now. There were old uh, Coke Coke bottle cases, you know, pop bottle cases, and she had taken the bottle caps from out of the out of the dispenser and nailed them all over the all over the the cases as well right so there was there was kind of art at every level and in every place and all over the place right and the, so it was kind of a magical kind of place i thought i was surprised to hear that uh, molly actually ran for city council in melville what can you tell me about that? She told me one time that she had uh, she was going to run for council, and then she told me that she was successful and was was uh, elected to council. And I believe she served two terms on council. I'm not sure exactly how long, but I know that she told me that she was really. And I asked her how come she didn't continue, and she said, "Well, she really wanted to get elected because she thought that there were some." things that needed to that weren't being addressed uh at least in the outer outlying parts of the of the city uh some of the outer districts where where she and other elderly people were living amongst them i think there were a number of homes that didn't have proper sewage facilities and water and so forth and she thought that the city was really needed to step up and and take care of all of this, right? So she decided to run for council and she lobbied for that and worked for that to have that happen. And then as soon as that was done, and I don't think, I don't think that 
she didn't say that the city council was opposed to all of that. I think that maybe just nobody had really sort of taken it on as a, as a priority. She prioritized it and she uh, saw it through. And then once that happened and the, things, the, the thing was online and, then, and, then, and the water services and so forth were brought to those to those homes that were that were in, she thought were in need, she thought she'd done her her stint on council, and it was somebody else's turn. So she didn't see it. She didn't have the ambition to make it into a career or anything like that. Just mm-hmm. that she sort of saw a um, a need that was out there, and she thought it she would help to address it and bring it to fruition. Yeah, like her father. Yeah, like her father. Now that you say that, yeah, I guess it's like that. Probably she got some of that from her father, that things needed to be done, right? And somebody, I guess somebody at some point has to step up and sort of take it on. Mm. Among the works uh, by Molly Lenhart that you've donated to the Mackenzie Art Gallery are a number of portraits of you and your wife, Ronnie, and your children by Molly. Uh, what did your friendship mean to her? I think she appreciated the fact that I was an artist, as she identified herself as. Uh, so we identified on that level. I think that she appreciated the struggles that we were having, uh, you know, that artists of all, of all stripes go through. And she also, I think, appreciated the fact that I was interested in the work that she was doing and that I also brought other artists by to see her or that expressed interest and were interested in her work as well. She did a portrait of me and and Ronnie. She did a portrait of the two of us with our kids. She did a portrait of our eldest son for a graduation portrait. She did a portrait of Joe Fafard. She did a portrait of Joe and his family. There's it's a very known one. It was a, I think it was in Arts Canada or somewhere where they were they were in a canoe. Uh, with a grain elevator behind, and it basically it was a canoe in a, in a slough in front of Pence, right? <laughs> but it kind of looked like it was in the wilderness. Well, maybe Pence is a kind of wilderness. I don't know. <laughs> and she did a portrait of Vic Sikansky and of Russ Uristy, and I think those kind of came about uh, as a result of a project that we, invo- we involved her with. We were, uh, the four of us, Uristy and Sikansky, Joe Fafard and myself, were commissioned by the provincial government to create a work of art for the Montreal Olympics in 1976. And one of the, one of the parts of that was a, we commissioned Molly to paint a mural for the back wall of the piece. And uh, so she had spent some time obviously making the painting, but then had spent time in Silton where we were working on the piece and got to know and meet and know uh, Russell and Vic and she had known Joe before and myself, of course. So it was through that kind of association, I think, that the friendship evolved and grew. And so she did us all with portraits. Another portrait that she made, I think it might be, I think I might have given it to the Mackenzie. I'm not sure. It was a portrait. There, The Mackenzie was having a Ronald Bloor exhibition. And in the newspaper was a portrait, was, a, was an interview with, uh, with, or an article on the upcoming exhibition with a photograph of Ron Bloor and Art Mackay and Nancy Dillo, who was the director of the Mackenzie at the time, standing in front of one of Ronald Bloor's paintings. And the painting was titled, The Order, the exhibition was titled, The Ordered Mind. Or the, not the exhibition, I'm sorry, the article was titled, The, the Ordered Mind. So the painting is titled, The Ordered Mind. And I, I bought the painting from Molly and when I was taking it home, I asked her why there was, was a portrait of Ronald Bloor and Art Mackay. And I said, how come Nancy Dillo isn't in the photograph, in the painting? She was in the photograph that she used, not in the painting. She said, well, she's not an artist, is she? <laughs> and I said, as far as I know, she's not an artist, no. <laughs> so Molly had her heroes kind of in the correct order. Right, yes. Uh, the artists were, were at the heart of the community. Yes, yeah. exactly. How important was her example for you? I'm thinking now of that, uh, the painting, uh, The Poet's Dream House. And you did a series, I don't know if it was not too long after that, called, uh, we did a series of dream houses yourself, including one called Ethnic Dream House. Were they in any way inspired by Molly's work? Well, I think all of my work in those days and all of it continues in some way to be inspired by Molly and those other artists. I'm thinking of McCarger and Wesley Dennis and Jean Tamrat, who I mentioned earlier, and Ann Harbus and Harvey McGinnis and 
and Sam Spen and on and on. And Molly is certainly at the center of all of that too. I think that the, uh, the ethnic thing for me doesn't specifically come from Molly, although it's an interesting association that you make. Uh, the dream home was a kind of a theme that I developed of different homes in, the, in and around the city uh, that I referred to as dream home. In the 1950s when I was a kid, the uh, Regina exhibition used to every year, I think it was the Kinsman or something like that, that had a dream home right? So <laughs> you could buy tickets and you could win the dream home. Mm. And my mother was always absolutely uh, religious about buying a ticket on the dream home. Of course, she never won it, but I had this whole thing. So then when I started making these paintings of these inner city homes and so forth, the idea of dream home came to me. And it also relates to a, uh, it relates also to a uh, conversation that I had with, so I suppose Molly Lenhart's in there, but it also relates to a conversation I had with Jean Tomrat once, where she talked about her, she did a lot of paintings of small homes that either she had lived in or that, you know, and she said, every home can be a dream. It doesn't have to be a castle, right? Every dream, every home can be a dream, can be your dream home. Hmm. And so that's really, all of those kinds of associations were what dream, it just seemed like dream homes seemed to be the notion that the dream home is however you define it, right? It's your dream. I still miss her, actually. It was really a treat and an honor to have known her. 